Wir machen auch sofort, Professor Reiner hat das eben schon angesprochen, sofort weiter und zwar mit Audrey Teng. Sie ist Digitalministerin in Taiwan, which is why I'm going to switch into English. A warm welcome to you, Audrey Tang. It's good to have you here. Hello, good local time, everyone. You are in charge of social innovation, open government and youth engagement. Um, and you obviously have a lot of projects um, considering the topic of our talk, which is digital social innovation. Maybe we start there and maybe we start explaining what you, in your opinion, in your meaning and what you're doing is actually digital social innovation. Certainly. So social innovation is everyone's business with everyone's help. And for us, it means innovating uh, from the government, not just for the citizens, but with the citizens. That's social innovation. Of course, it depends on a free uh, society with the freedom of the press, of assembly and things like that. As you can see, we're almost equally free, uh, Taiwan and Germany. Uh, and uh, when the society faces emergent situations, for example, last year in May, when we faced our first uh, real wave of COVID alpha variant, uh, instead of concentrating data to a multinational corporation or concentrating data to the state, we ask the social sector the civic technologist to come up with the privacy preserving design that could shorten the contact tracing from 24 hours or more to less than 24 minutes, which is partly why uh, as of yesterday, we still only have 15 daily local cases of Omicron. And it works uh, very simply. You see a built-in camera. It sends a toll-free SMS. So that's it. So just with two or three seconds, everyone can very quickly complete a check-in, but the venue owner learns nothing about your phone, and your phone telecom operator learns nothing about where the venue is. Um, and so through this privacy-enhancing technology, we make sure that people do not trade privacy or personal data uh, freedom uh, to the public health uh, measures, and that enabled the trustworthiness to build over time because of the mutual accountability. Everyone can see which contact tracer have looked at which um, identities and so on in the previous 28 days and uh, download it even uh, when they go to this SMS.1922. So because this is designed by the civic technologist, not by a contractor uh, or a uh, state employee, we call this reverse procurement, where the social sector sets the norm and we implement this norm. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you also to show um, concrete products, which is obviously always very helpful to see what it is that it, we are actually talking about and to see um, what we can do. Um, maybe before we go on, you've, uh, you've spoken a lot about privacy, which is obviously very important. Um, We've, we've had the CIO of Germany today, this morning already. Um, we always feel like we're lacking behind in Germany, and maybe we actually do. So maybe could you explain a little bit, how did you get there? Like, what did the government do? How did you, how did you basically had to explain it? Did you have to convince someone? Yes, um, I think privacy is uh, very, very important. And it's not just that a government can say, oh, we use the latest technology, the cutting edge technology, so therefore it is private. This would be like saying, trust us. It doesn't work this way. Uh, it's the other way around. We need to trust our citizens to inspect uh, as I mentioned, the accountability trail. We need to, when our citizens tell us uh, that the measurement uh, is off, that there is a data bias and so on, we need to incorporate that very quickly into decision making. For example, um, before the pandemic, uh, Taiwan had a lot of primary schoolers uh, and middle schoolers measuring air quality using what we call the air box in their schools or balconies and so on. And together they form a distributed ledger that teaches data stewardship in the schools, but also informs their parents whether they should go out to jog or hike uh, based on the PM 2.5 levels. And so I believe that this is uh, a step beyond 
the literacy in media literacy or data literacy, where we just teach the students how to consume the data. This is data competence, meaning that everybody can actually fact check the three presidential candidates as they're having a debate. Everyone can live stream the counting process when we're counting the presidential ballot. Everybody can measure the air quality and so on. So they understand the technology like Lego blocks. So when it's used then for contact trade for counter pandemic, people understand exactly how it works in the cybersecurity and privacy parameters because they've had experience with these technological components before the pandemic. Mm. From your perspective, um, um, there will be a lot of Europeans now saying, "Well, we also um, have a very high, very, um, very high take on privacy, and we because we do have GDPR, it's considered to be one of the one of the strongest in the world." Meanwhile, it's not coming from the direction that you were talking about. It doesn't come from the citizens. It did come from like states statesmen uh, and women, obviously. Um, so, so does, does that mean that? Like maybe it's lacking on that point that people feel like it's been pushed onto them rather than pushing it themselves. Yes, exactly. As you said, if this is a procurement where the state asks a IT contractor to design things, even if maybe uh, perfect, but a citizen, because they was not part of the design process, naturally had fear, uncertainty, and doubt about it. But in Taiwan, what we're doing is reverse procurement. It's uh, essentially the citizens crowdsourcing the agenda, the specification, the human right protection, and so on, even before we even started any procurement process. So because the demands, the requirement came from people, it ceased to be a just a demonstration against something like we want to take something down but it's a demonstration in a sense of demo uh, people show those small scale experiments like airbox and so on and then we have a mechanism that lifts uh, them into national scale deployment very quickly. So it always starts with the not-for-profits, the social entrepreneurs, the civil uh, innovators, but they prove it on a small town or something and then we just lift it to the countrywide scale. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, let's say, bottom-up approach, um, does it actually, let's talk a little bit about, um, well, democracy itself, um, does it help your trust in government from um, from the people in Taiwan? Because what we see in, I guess, in Germany and uh, in most places all over the world, that trust in governments, especially during the COVID pandemic, um, is going down. People don't trust the facts anymore, or like, let's say, a larger amount of people don't trust facts anymore. Does this bottom-up um, help? Yes. Um, you're referring, I believe, to uh, the infodemic, right? The overwhelming of information and people simply don't have the mental bandwidth uh, to tell the scientific facts and clarifications vis-a-vis uh, -vis conspiracy theories and so on. And in Taiwan, uh, what we're focusing on is the open government design where people can literally get a hold of me very easily. This is my office, like literally my office. I just came from there. Uh, it's the Social Innovation Lab in the heart of Taipei City. And every Wednesday, everyone can book uh, 40 minutes of my time, or they simply walk in, uh, or video conference or whatever. Uh, and then uh, they're allowed to basically bring any innovations to me. The only thing I ask is that they're radically transparent, meaning the uh, entire uh, conversation is posted free of copyright as a transcript online or as a video uh, online in a creative commons. And so people wouldn't lobby for their self-interest at the expense of other people because it would look really bad. Uh, and then uh, the ideas just uh, add on each other. But of course, if you can't travel to Taipei or book at 40 minutes uh, time for each and every uh, issues that uh, warrants this kind of uh, listening process, we also have a AI or assistive intelligence powered conversation at polis, uh, .gov .tw. So it's an infrastructure that is pro-social, unlike the other more anti-social social media. Uh, this social media is designed to be pro-social, so you're looking at the actual uh, 
clusters of the Uber X case in 2015, when people deliberated about what to do uh, with the Uber X phenomena. Now, people uh, very quickly after three weeks agreed on a lot of things, which is quite surprising that everyone agreed with their neighbors on most of the things most of the time. And that's because the design of the system was that we don't uh, reply to each other, we don't shout each other down. Rather, this measures the plurality of feelings and people have to uh, you know, agree or disagree on each other's feelings, but convince people of different groups, different clusters, in order for their ideas to become binding, that is to say, to be set as the agenda. So because of this pro-social space, we eventually uh, just legalized Uber as a local taxi company, but the local taxi union, social entrepreneurships, um, local temples and churches all benefit uh, from this because that's uh, pretty much what everybody agreed on. So my main message is just that there are digital equivalent of town halls and so on, that we can mm -hmm. actually get this listening as scale. How does it how does it work in collaboration with companies? So you like transparency is definitely something that um, citizens do want and it's good for them. Co the companies tend to not want to be as transparent because obviously they do have uh, for good reason, you know, they have um, secrets that they don't want to share. How does this actually work together? How does it how do they interact? Yes. So uh, I call this people public private partnership where the people, the social sector, sets the norm. And the government, as I mentioned, amplify this norm. Now, if you are Uber, or if you are Taiwan Taxi, or some other taxi companies, and you already see that your own drivers and other competitors' drivers and passengers all already agree on not undercutting each other's meters, on registration, on insurance, and things like that, uh, then really uh, the only thing left to do uh, is to um, come to our stakeholder meeting live streamed uh, and see uh, exactly how that you may implement such social norm. And so I think this uh, is a way for the private sector to work uh, within the norm that's set by the social sector. Another example was uh, in 2019 uh, when Facebook and other social media companies agreed uh, to publish all the political and social advertisements who funds it and also ban foreign funded uh, advertisement leading up to our election and so on, not because the state passed a law, we didn't pass a law on that, but rather because there's an implicit threat of social sanction if they do not conform to the local norm that's already agreed upon by the local social media. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, uh, because you've just mentioned elections, I want to I wanna stress one point. Um, we, when you are as digitalized and as transparent, mm -hmm. um, is it a threat that you're more vulnerable to cybersecurity threats, um, especially when it comes to collection? There's a lot of uh, fake news and there's a lot of, well, like state sponsors, hackers who want to, well, mm -hmm. like influence whatever is happening. Is that a threat for you that's concerning you? Um Yes, uh, of course, uh, since that we both uh, share a polity that is very committed on the freedom of speech, of course, there could be uh, disinformation and information manipulation. And in Taiwan, we choose a strategy uh, called humor over humor. That is to say, uh, whenever we detect that there is a uh, viral uh, disinformation that's going rampant, uh, instead of taking it down, we simply post uh, a public notice uh, to it. Uh, that uh, does contact tracing, uh, like finding out uh, where exactly did it come from, and also to uh, counter it using very humorous visual communication and so on. So the communication that is a clarifying effect actually goes even more viral uh, than the disinformation itself. I can't go into detail because of time, but if you search for humor over rumor, you'll find a playbook. Very interesting approach. I definitely do will have a look into this. There is two questions from the audience and then I have one or two myself again. Um, the most uh, first question from the audience is the most European politicians spend most of time for paperwork in terms of digitalization. How many hours do you spend with paperwork daily? 
Um, I think close to zero because I automate uh, all my paperwork. Uh, I uh, literally compiled, recompiled the Linux kernel uh, as my first action when I become digital minister in 2016. So that because I'm a teleworking minister since 2016, um, anything that is paper based must be digitalized in order uh, for me to have a timely turnaround. And once they're, they're digitalized, if it's entirely routine, then of course I just write some scripts. Uh, to automate it. And it's been more than five years. So I've automated, uh, I think, 99.9% .9 of it. Did you did that? Did you have to convince your colleagues to to follow up on this, or did you? Well, in Germany, I promise you one thing: there will be a huge discussion about it, and there will be people saying it's not going to work. And you know what I mean? Like this whole transformation topic will be a huge discussion. Yeah, uh, and it was uh, something like that. Back in 2016, I think uh, the major media did a poll and only slightly over 60% of people support me in my teleworking. Uh, and so uh, I think less than half supported this general adoption by public servants. Uh, so of course, there are people who feel uh, that uh, it's much more comfortable if they see each other in the same room and see the handwriting on the paper and things like that. And uh, my position was always that I'm not uh, here to replace uh, these uh, paper-based analog technologies. I'm just here to show uh, that alternatives is possible, but you don't have to uh, use those. Uh, and it's very consistent, it's very predictable that when we roll out anything that is digital, for example, the SMS-based contact tracing that I just shown, uh, we always say that you can still continue to write your way in or you stamp your way in and keep your analog way of recording contact tracing detail. We never uh, replace it by a top-down mm -hmm. order. So that's why I think uh, it was possible for people to gradually come to terms with digital transformation without being felt uh, as forced to. Mm -hmm. uh, before we come to the last question, because I feel like that's um, that's a very good question for, for the end of our talk, um, I want to ask you about uh, broadband, because um, obviously broadband connection in Taiwan is, well, is, regard, uh, is regarded as a human mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, in Germany, we have been talking about this for years, um, and uh, depending on who you ask, obviously telecommunications companies say we're actually quite advanced, other people say not so much. Um, everyone was really surprised this morning that one of um, uh, that, that the CIO actually was able to have a video conversation in his car, um, and I think the surprise fact of that shows where we are. Um, so, um, so to be to have a to be digital social innovative. Where are you in terms of actually connecting people? Do they feel connected? Is everyone actually able to be online? Yes. Uh, and that is because we make sure that no one is left behind. Even on the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, you're still guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second for just 15 euros per month, unlimited data. Otherwise, it's my fault, like personally. Uh, people wrote me emails saying they're in this Yangming Mountain quarantine place. They uh, spend half a day to send this email. The uh, signal is weak. They can't watch uh, streaming TV and they're suffering from human rights violation. Uh, and then uh, I made sure that within just two weeks, uh, it's fixed. There's a repeater that we set up. And the person, of course, is already out of quarantine. But they made a point of driving back and measure broadband speed and posting on social media to hold me accountable. So that's the kind of commitment uh, that one needs to take. And also the kind of participatory nature of our citizens in ensuring that we're actually uh, being held accountable. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe when we come back to um, like a real uh, innovative factor, um, the, there's a question, what does your digital lunar new year looks like? Will you celebrate it this year still at your home or in metaverse? <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, I always uh, make sure that I participate in some creative uh, activities, not just in Lunar New Year, uh, but in my uh, off time in general. Um, sometimes I would just uh, put on my XR space uh, glass uh, and visit with some artist friends many time zones away uh, and uh, go to some um, like high mountain uh, or the space station and so on and just meditate a little bit there uh, and uh, also uh, do some creative uh, work there. I think the last uh, artistic co-creation we did was uh, virtually uh, on the Matterhorn uh, mountain. I think it was in uh, Alps, right, in Switzerland. 
Okay, that sounds really nice. I'm actually super curious to see when I'm going to be first time in Metaverse um, because there's obviously um, um, a lot of talks around that uh, here. Um, my, my last question actually would be, um, you've you've talked about a bottom-up approach. You talked about that there needs to be um, a, a value for the citizens, a value for the people who use technology, and then obviously they're going to use it more, and then uh, that's going to be more transparency, more trust in democracy, more trust in the government, everything. Um, It sounds so obvious <laughs> that I'm sometimes surprised that we're not actually there in other countries yet. Why do you think that is? Um, I think that is because for a society to see that the technologies are there to connect people and people instead of just connecting people to machines or machine to machines, uh, we really need to uh, phrase our uh, technological terms a, a different way. That is to say, instead of uh, like when I just became the digital minister in 2016, I said that, oh, my job description is just those SDG goals, effective partnership, reliable data, open innovation. Uh, our HR people told me that ministry is not going to work. You need to speak in plain language that people actually used to speak, which is why my job description is now a prayer, a poem for the past six years now, which I'll read very quickly. Uh, which is a translation of these in plain language goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, we need to always remember the plurality is here. So embrace plurality and social innovation will follow. Perfect. Perfect last words. Thank you very much. Very inspiring. And I think that's definitely something that we're going to take on for next discussions coming up, but also for other discussions that are going to be with us throughout the year. Hope to see you again soon. I actually booked a flight to Taiwan in April 2020. And obviously that never happened because then COVID hit. But I'm still hoping forward to come and look uh, to come to Taipei myself and have a look at it myself. Thank you very much Thank for you. being with us today. Live long and prosper.